Hey everyone, how we doing tonight? It's Wednesday again. We're doing another live fly tying event at the shop. We've closed down for the night, turned all the lights out, busted out the vise, and we're going to tie some more mergers tonight. So I'm doing a solo tie tonight, so I have no tech support. Uh, so I'll be doing this myself, so bear with me. A little more clicking involved, a little bit uh, more of me looking off screen, but we've done this enough now this is i think number five so if you've watched all of these i think you get some sort of gold star but i think we've done it enough we can handle this i'm pretty excited um if i get a little nervous so what it happens i don't at least i don't have luke here laughing at me or you know brian getting stressed out brian spending time with his mom if you're watching brian get some quality time in luke is actually i think at jujitsu or some weird you know martial arts thing he's getting his butt kicked tonight so um looks like we got about 15 16 people in already that's awesome um hopefully the the volume is functioning for you everyone let me know if your audio is good on your end we only have one mic going tonight so we shouldn't have much of that interference that echo we've had before but it's our first dry fly night of the season we've been really focused on streamers and you know that's there's a reason for that because hold on let me turn that off um most of the feedback from you guys has been streamers 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 and i'm excited because i talked to russ madden today and he's down to do at least one night he's not doing much travel this year which is you know kind of a, a net gain for us we're gonna have him and be able to pick his brain he knows more than most of us will ever be able to figure out um, we're going to have Johnny Ray coming soon. We're going to have Corey Golden's going to be tying some really cool classic wets. Uh, my friend Tommy, you guys might know Tommy, he actually designed this sweatshirt. These are available now uh, in our online store at northernangler.com. Brand new design we're running. Uh, he's going to be tying a really big, cool pike tube, which is pretty exciting. Something different you might not usually see. He'll, of course, talk about how convert that to a hook if you want but tubes have been really su successful for him and I over the past few years um, but first we're gonna let's just jump right in we're gonna be tying kind of this moose body merger you probably saw it in the opening screen here this guy um, something a little bit different than you might usually use for a body the second one we're gonna tie with you know you're kind of your standard turkey quill but I don't see tons of people using turkey quills so we're going to just kind of revisit that and run you through how that looks um thanks everybody i'm getting good comments no angry comments about volume tonight or echoing that's perfect um but we're going to start out with this hook uh this is a daichi 1167 let me switch over so you can see that we're going to tie on a size 12 tonight. It's just going to be easier for you all to see. But these are great from size 12 all the way up to 18s. They're a little bit longer than a standard hook. But they're designed so that the butt end of this fly sits below the surface. This fly is really, really good for rivers like the Manistee, the Asaba, where we have really calm, quiet waters. This is not what I'd be fishing out west where you have riffle water and pools and things like that this is a george foreman set it and forget it fly it will float down the river and just you don't even have to put much floating on these so emergers are great especially for these rivers i fish more emergers probably than your standard dry fly with you know maybe a spade hackle tail or a split moose um, but we'll get into that later I'm going to set this in my vise, and I may actually reposition this as we go because I want to be able to access the back end here so I can put my tailing material in. This is going to be just uni 6 ot in white, nothing fancy here. I'm going to start about a quarter of the way down the shank. Once I get that started, I'm going to rest my thread so it, it uh, kind of intersects with the point of the hook there. 
for the tail material with emergers most of the time we're not using a real stiff material that's what I was referring to earlier with that spade hackle yarn is typically the preferred method to go you could even tie these without and they'll still fish really well the big mistake I see a lot of folks make is using too much material if you want to fly where the butt kind of sinks below the surface if you pack it full of materials it's not going to sink below the surface it's going to get caught up in the film it'll turn over it could be a good emerger pattern or excuse me a good cripple pattern but you want this to be a, a mayfly in transition so i'm going to trim some antron yarn here this colorway by the way is is real reminiscent for me at least of the Borchers drake which if you don't know the Borchers drake you should it's probably one of the better flies you can have in your fly box for any dark colored mayflies we have in Michigan. So this, this is way too much. I'm going to use maybe a third of this if I can and see how when you use a, a lot less it kind of kind of splays out there. It gets kind of wacky. We want this to be a bad hair day because this is this is what's left of the nymphal shuck. They're trying to you know, shed their clothes and emerge as an adult insect here at this point. So I'll even pull these apart so they're uneven. I'm gonna set this on here. Use a pinch wrap, just so it stays on top of the shank. I'm not gonna go all the way down I'm going to work back up the shank here. I want to cover this stuff up as much as possible. I don't want any loose ends. Okay. Now for the main event with this fly, the moose body. If you haven't tied with moose body, you should. It's one of the better tailing materials that are out there it's extremely affordable you you really have to to try and spend money on this it's not expensive and it's going to last you a long time i really like these pieces where you get a mix of coloration in there i hope you can all see that you get kind of some light almost white colors you get tans you get dark browns and that's that's what i want i want these to be a mix of colors instead of just one color but before we tie that in, I, I left myself a note here not to forget. We need to tie in a little bit of wire. This is extra small copper. Just break yourself off a piece. You shouldn't need wire cutters with this stuff. It's very fine. I'll wrap that back down right to where I finished tying the tails. That yarn off. they see okay uh, Dave has asked if I've ever tried to spin moose hair and I have not um, I'd, I'd love to hear how that went if if anyone has tried that um, it's not commonly thought of as a spinning hair you know elk sure you know obviously we've done coyote but in a dubbing loop a little bit different um, tons of deer hair stuff but I haven't tried moose uh, although I have a shocking amount of it. I actually was digging through my bins this morning and I have a patch about, I'm not kidding, it's, it's a big, big patch. We had a guy that knew a taxidermist a few years ago and just brought us piles of stuff. We couldn't use all of it. There was so much. So um, maybe I should try that since I have so much of it. All right, I'm going to bring that thread right back to where I was right at the point of the hook. I'm gonna snip myself some moose hair here. This is way too much. We're, we're really looking for a small amount, maybe six fibers at the most. But the reason I chopped this, you're gonna have some small fibers that are just gonna be waste. And then I, I really, I'm really picky about mixing those colors in so I will stack it. The only reason I'm stacking this is it makes tying in a lot easier. 
you don't need to work very hard at stacking this. If you use too many fibers, it's going to bind on itself and you won't be able to create a really smooth body that has that natural segmentation in it. This is still too many fibers. So I'm just going to start picking away. I want to make sure I have a good mix of colors in there. This is probably eight fibers, maybe ten. I'm sure you guys are going to watch the replay on this and count them for me and tell me I'm wrong, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, mix those around. Tips are going to face the eye of the hook here. That's really important. I'm going to tie these with a little bit of overlap. I hope you can actually see some of those tips there. I'm trying to catch your wire like I just did. That tells me I just broke off too much. And I like this, this six aught thread. I can spin it a little bit counterclockwise and get a really flat application. Now here's something I do. I'll grab everything I've tied in so far. So the tail yarn, the wire, and the moose body and lift it all. And what I'm looking at is do they all end at the same point? And that's going to help me start the moose and make sure there's not thread showing. You know, I use white thread for a, a vast majority of things, white and black thread. If you're worried about your thread showing through, you're probably worrying too much, first of all. But that's a good trick you can get away from uh, having your thread show at the end of your fly. All right, these tips I'm just going to trim off. Great. All right, I'm actually going to create a bit of a taper. And really, I just want to smooth out some of the dips I've created when while tying all this stuff in. So smooth is, is the way to go here. Now, because this clink hammer style hook curves a lot, I'm actually going to add a half hitch right here. I was used to tell my fly tying students if they remembered Windows 95, there's a paper clip would pop up on your screen to remind you to save your work. That's what half hitches are. All right. Now, you do not need the rotary function for this, but we're going to try it. We have it, right? Why not? That's why we buy a nice vise. And it's, it's helpful sometimes to give your moose a little bit of a twist here. It'll help bind it together. Because it isn't the most durable material. It's pretty darn durable. I slipped a piece there. That's okay. Move that binder or the uh, cradle out of the way. And as with all my materials, I usually tie them off with three wraps on top and three in front. And we got a really cool kind of natural segmentation built out of that body right there. Trim off your excess. Now I'm going to do a half hitch again. You know, I started tying without a rotary vise. And it's just been a really nice addition for applying really delicate materials. I've been a big fan and, you know, I, I still do tie with my non-rotary vise, um, but for doing stuff like this, soft hackles, you'll see in the next next fly we're going to do, it's really, really nice. You can just, so much control without having to pass materials over that shank. All right, we're going to go the opposite way. Always counter wraps with your wire. Remember that if you're trying to lock a material in, whether it's turkey, whether it's a, you know, pheasant tail is a really obvious one. You want to use counter wraps with your wire because it's going to lock it in, make it more durable. Space these out a little bit. And we get some questions about wire 
on a dry fly. And remember, this is a quote unquote dry fly. This is, I want this section of the fly to be under the water because it looks vulnerable to those fish. That's what the emerger stage is. And that's why it's so enticing to our fish is it's very vulnerable. And I bring the bobbin right up to the shank here, grab your wire, we do the old helicopter trick, snaps right off, no big deal. All right, I just repositioned it there. You can see this shank actually gives me almost a flat space up top where I'm going to tie in some hackle. I'm going to use some deer hair here as well to kind of give it a little flotation at the top. You can get creative at the top of your fly. It's a lot of fun to do that. Um, I've seen some really cool stuff with foam over the years. I love deer hair. It's a natural material. It's fairly friendly to use and it's extremely affordable. Let me put this away real quick. I stay hydrated. It's important. All right. Before we get there, though, we're going to coat this. We're going to use a, we're actually going to use Loon Flow UV fly finish. And I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear if any of you out there have used UV finish on dry flies before. I know a lot of you use it on nymphs, but the idea here, one, again, durability, but it will streamline, it will coat all this moose which is hollow like most natural hairs deers deer elk all that is hollow and is usually somewhat buoyant but that will help streamline this section of the fly and allow it to sink underneath a little bit faster oh that's just coming out and it looks cool i mean this is a you can show off with this fly a little bit, even though it's pretty easy to tie. Grab my UV light. Cap this thing. All right, we're looking good. I always do the UV before I get to deer hair or anything because as, as fine of a tip as you can get with these, it still tends to go everywhere. I mean, it's on my hands now. It's not ideal, but we can deal with that. Um, let's see. First thing we got to do is grab some hackle. Now, I'm not going to give you a full rundown of hackle tonight, but to let you know, we're going to be tying with a saddle. Saddles are really nice for dry flies because they're really consistent in their width. So you see that up on the screen? Look how consistent that is. And it makes it really, really friendly to tie with. Necks, on the other hand, tend to give you a much larger range of sizes. You can get anywhere from 24s all the way up to streamer size hackles. But they tend to be a lot shorter and the usable space on that feather is a lot less. Whereas I could tie probably, I don't know, maybe five to eight flies with this one feather, maybe more, because this fly, for doesn't, for example, doesn't use a lot of hackle. So, real simple. Um, this is Pro Grade, by the way. If you're curious, Whiting Pro Grade. Trying to get it on screen. It's easier to get it on this one. These are really nice for the money. Plus, they're well suited for Michigan size flies. If you're tying smaller stuff. Think about the bronze, maybe the silvers out there. A hundred packs are a great way to go to if you know what size flies you're going to be tying in the future. I still have hundred packs from probably eight years ago or more, and they still work awesome. Gauge this out. This is between a 12 and a 14 on my gauge, which is perfect. I don't need a huge hackle on this. I'm going to prep this by splaying these out. Bart, thanks for tuning in. There is a material list. Um, 
I realized this morning, I do apologize that I, I didn't actually complete the link in there, but if you go to our live fly tying page and scroll down to this action, this event for this day and click on that, there will be a material list. Or if you just search um, my name, Matt Hartman, on our website, it should pop up, I hope so. All right, I'm gonna trim this. There's always a concave for feathers. This is important. And I really like this to be tied in with the concave facing towards the tail of the fly. So to do that, I always like to tie in, or excuse me, prep this by trimming the feather a little bit. I trim right down to the stem. The reason we don't peel these off is it makes the stem really slippery. By trimming close to the stem, it gives you a lot of material for that thread to grip onto, and that's really important if you want to tie durable flies. Usually, on the side I want to tie or wrap towards first, I'll trim a little bit extra. And I hope, if I put that there, you can see one side is trimmed up a little bit higher. I'm going to wrap this on number three or four. Try and save sp space up by the eye. That's always still to this day the number one mistake a lot of new tires make is crowding the eye. Always go with the, the lightest thread you can get away with and the least amount of wraps you can get away with. That's your best friend. So, okay, I'm going to wrap right back to the base of this. Stick this in the material clip. And this is a, honestly, this is probably a uh, optional step. I'm going to add a teeny bit of dubbing here. Very small amount of dubbing. This is brown super fine, by the way. Super fine. And I'll actually, it's a little goofy, but to bridge this gap, sometimes I'll wrap around behind. And that was a, that you can all agree, I hope this is, that was a very small amount of dubbing. And again, a lot of new tires will use way too much dubbing. This is just a, a base for this hackle. You, most people could probably skip this step, but I wanted to show that that's an option. Um, if you want maybe a little bit more flotation. We have to save space up here or that deer hair wing at the very end, but we're just going to start palmering this hackle. No need to use the rotary here. That's the beauty of this, this hackle. If you can see on my lower screen here, look how much I have to work with. You don't need hackle pliers. I, I mean, I have chunky hands. I can manipulate this just fine. All right, I'm going with total of about five wraps. And you might laugh. I mean, you might, I'm just going to actually, let's go with four. Oops. Still in focus there. Tie that off. You're going to laugh because I'm going to trim all this down. Because I don't need all of it. It serves a very, very simple purpose. All right. You could tie it like this. I feel like we're tying a Tenkara fly right now. But I'm actually going to rotate this. I'm going to trim most of this hackle underneath flat. And that's that serves as kind of outriggers. If you can imagine that, you know, it's... I just don't, with the full round hackle, you can't guarantee that it's not just going to turn over on its side and turn into a cripple, which could work great. I mean, that's fine if you're into that. All right, see, I trimmed that way down, and that's serving as, as outriggers on the side. And then we're going to do one more trim. And this one's going to be a little bit harder to see. I'll rotate it back up. And what I want to do is actually come in to the very top in the center. 
and create cut out a bit of a V in that hackle. And that's gonna it's gonna do two things. One, it's gonna make room for the deer hair I'm gonna tie in there. And two, it's gonna support it and actually keep it right where I want it to be. So I'm gonna come in here and it's always helpful if you can put your left hand on your vise and actually I use my thumb off that left hand to support my scissors. I find my cuts are much more accurate, much steadier, especially if you're a big coffee drinker and tying in the morning. Great. Looking good there. See, I mean, we, we had tied in this beautiful hackle. And we, we chopped it all up, but it has a purpose, remember. Next, we're going to grab some. I'm just going to use Comparadon uh, deer hair here. From nature spirit um, we've started to carry a lot more nature spirit products at the shop and it's it's really good stuff from their deer hair to their CDC which you're gonna see in the next fly to all sorts of fun stuff they tend to have really really high quality materials um, and it's not too much more but once you've tied with you know gosh substandard hackle versus decent hackle it makes a huge difference I think we can all agree on that the reason why I want to use comparadon hair versus say deer body hair is the length of the tips when you're tying small dry flies and you use body hair those tips are twice or three times as long as on this comparadon hair and then what you tie in turns it into all tips and it's just it doesn't look good. It's with it's really light and wispy. And what's the point of tying in deer hair if it's just going to be all tips? So these tend to have very short, fine tips, and it tends to look really good on flies like the Comparadon, which is what this is hair is is sold as. But I'm gonna grab a deer hair comb. Let's try and comb this out as much as possible. There's always a little bit of fluff in there. Grab my stacker. Less is more here, but just like with the moose, I'll tend to start with a little bit more. If you can see, it's always tough to. This is probably half of a pencil diameter. I think that's always fairly helpful. I don't know what we're going to do in the future when I've heard this rumor that, that they don't teach cursive handwriting and stuff anymore. Well, we'll know what pencil. How about half a pen? Everybody writes with a pen, right? So. We'll do that. I don't know if you can see those tips in there, how nice and fine they are. I should have grabbed you some regular body hair to compare with, but I thought this would be sufficient. All right, we're going to stack that. Trick with a stacker, if you're new to stacking deer hair, by the way, is always open the stacker with the tips already oriented in the direction you want to tie them in. Right there, just like so. And that just evens things up. This is about twice as much hair as I want in here. How am I doing on time? Oh, doing great. So I'm gonna pinch the tips with my left index and thumb and just pull some of these out. That's why it's really nice to have a little hand vacuum at your desk. Let's check. Uh, hey, Lee, thanks for tuning in tonight. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Please tie that fly. Lee asked everyone, I'm sure you can see that, um, if he can use his hair uh, since it's turning uh, multicolored. Absolutely. Um, I had someone try and bring me some of their cat hair once. Um, I know guys that'll tie flies with their dog hair. Um, why not? I mean, try it. All right, we're going to measure this out. I always measure with my right hand, and then I transfer to my left hand. And I want these tips to be about even with where that tail material starts. Okay? And I transfer there. Now there's two ways to do this. We can trim it in, we can trim it first, or we can tie it in and trim it later. With a very small amount of deer hair like this, I'm gonna trim it first. And I trust my measurement with my thumb and index finger. 
I want to get that as close as possible. Everybody see that? Try and turn my fingers. I usually do two wraps. And then you notice I haven't let go with my left hand. This is really important because if you let go, it's going to start to spin. We want to pinch it down, cinch. Great. And that gives us kind of this crazy hairdo here that's going to give us this great emerger and make it very visible. This might be a little bit longer than I tie it sometimes, but I think it looks pretty good. It's a 12. I don't fish as many 12s as I do 14s, honestly, because this hook is a little bit longer, as I mentioned in the beginning. All right, and now to finish this off, your thumbnail becomes very, very important, which is why I always pack in my fly tying kit, especially when we're doing videos, <laughs> nail trimmers. So grab your thumbnail and twist back and forth, and we're going to hop our thread, see that, right up to the eye. From here, grab your whip finish tool. I'll probably do two sets of three or four whip finishes, or, you know, kind of turns of the whip finish tool, if you will. If you're worried about thread color, again, I know we used white here. You just hit it with a Sharpie. Looks great. Ready for your photo session, glamour shots, and the fish of your dreams. Rotate that around. And last thing I'll do is usually, excuse me, trim this in the bottom. And you can actually use a sawing motion with open scissors, especially if you have really sharp scissors. Well, these, even though they're pretty new, are not that sharp. Just don't cut it too short. That's about perfect. All right. Now, I don't have a fancy name for this. There's no, like you know, Dominator or some crazy shenanigans. This is just just another emerger with a uh, moose body. It's something different. I wanted to show you all that you can use a material in a different way and uh, apply it to the, the shank of a hook with a little bit of work and uh, some UV epoxy. And this will sit in the water. I'll actually orient this like it'll sit. Didn't bring a glass. But the water line tends to be right about right about here. And that back end, again, sits right under the water. It's super effective. You can add some flash in. This is, a, this is a good format to play with. It doesn't have to be moose hair. It can be whatever you want. So let's hop over to the chat screen and see if there are any questions we can answer. All right, I got, it's funny, you can't tell here, but I got like, I got two cameras, two screens, a big light, all sorts of fun stuff. So sometimes I'm still figuring out where to look. Um, we got 40 some people tuned in, which is awesome. Thank you everyone for tuning into these. And if you're a new subscriber, thank you so much. Um, really impressed. We've, we've shot up over 2000 subscribers um, and we gained over 700 in the last 90 days, which is mind-boggling uh, but we really appreciate it. we made some investments in gear and time to do these videos and try and put out some more content for all of you so we really appreciate the support it's it's awesome it's it's fun we love doing this so um, we all miss seeing your faces of course at the franklin um, but this maybe this is the future you never know um, questions about the fly fishing emergers um, I'll put a question out there, you know, again, have you guys ever used UV epoxy on dry flies? Has, has it worked for you? Have, you know, what application have you done? Um, have you tried any of these clink hammer hooks? Uh, they've been around for a while. The clink hammer itself is a whole style of fly. It's, it's a little bit different. Um, uses a parachute with a post and everything. So, but a great fly, a great emerger. Do you find success with emergers, standard dries? We're going to tie, the next fly we're going to tie uses, again, I mentioned biots, but 
it's a little bit closer to a standard dry fly. It uses some elements of an emerger, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, Peter, thanks for thanks for tuning in, man. We haven't seen you in a little while. Hope you had a good Christmas. Um, Brian, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, but again, all I, I probably will not tie this any larger than this 12 here. We carry these hooks up to it up to a 10, which if you're tying maybe an emerger for some drakes would work. Usually no smaller than an 18, but 18 is, you know, I say that I think of this hook as add one size to it. And by that, I mean a 12 is as close as you want to get to a 10 and an 18 is around a 16 probably. So it's extra long just for this purpose. Uh, let's see. Tommy, what's happening, man? Joe, how are you? <laughs> Joe, it's just like the green caddis, man. You just got to fish them. So we'll think we, we'll have to actually fish when the weather's nice. We only seem to talk about and get out fishing when it's when it's cold out there. Uh, let's see. Bart uh, says it's cool to be five hours away in, in Indiana and able to watch fly tying uh that's the idea with this is hopefully we can we can share some of this stuff and expand a little bit beyond just you know the folks that are local here during the winter we have so many people so many wonderful customers here that come and see us throughout the summer the spring summer fall steelhead season and we don't get to see them in the winter uh, and so it's it's really cool to be able to connect with everyone during the winter it's kind of windy it might be snowing out there right now but we get to do this which is great let's see pranking with uh christian uh well i didn't mention this yet uh we're sticking to dry flies tonight but cool thing about doing these videos on youtube is that you can go back and re-watch them so I would recommend going back to see last week's episode. Brian tied three or two or three steelhead nymphs, um, a stonefly and a caddis. My favorite really depends. It's tough to pick a favorite. Um, maybe I'll take the easy way out and say an egg fly. <laughs> they just work. Um, but he tied really some good steelhead flies that are quick to crank out because we truly believe in disposable flies for steelhead you're going to lose them and it shouldn't be painful to lose flies you should just re-rig and get back to it because those fish live in the wood and you're going to lose flies as you go so sometimes i think people put a little too much flare into their into their steelhead flies uh, but if you get enjoyment out of it you should do it i i love tying pretty flies obviously not all of them are this pretty but hope that's a a decent answer um let's see uh my wife annie te uh commented a while back let's see um unfortunately they're watching this instead of a horse movie our dog loves to watch horses on tv so i'm sorry hank i'll be home soon we can watch something with horses um all right oh craig how are you man jeez haven't seen that guy in a while probably about done with your uh your lake season right you're probably moving on to ice about now but um let me take a quick break i'm going to reset give me about two three minutes just move materials around and we're going to hop into the next fly everybody
All right, that's gotta be a new record. Quick change, I love it. Uh, next fly we're gonna be tying, we previewed in this Be Right Back screen we had here. This is gonna be a turkey biot kind of style. This is actually a, really close to a, a Shane Stalcup uh, CDC loop wing emerger pattern. If you haven't checked out some of his stuff, um, it's a little bit dated, but that doesn't mean it catches fish. It just means that people may have forgotten about it. So check these out. Uh, CDC is one of my absolute favorite materials to work with. I don't think enough people use it, and it's so well suited for our waters. Again, we, we talked again earlier at the beginning of this first fly about really calm waters and choosing your fly based on the water type. And we talked about that last week too, and I we hammer on that all the time, but just because you see it out there doesn't mean it's it's the right fly for the water type. And there's a there's some information about that out there. I think my favorite was always Dave Hughes book. Uh, I think it's Handbook of Hatches. I've lent that out so many times to people. It, it's full of my highlights from years and years ago and notes and it talks about how trout don't speak Latin and it makes perfect sense to, to match the water type. There's another book out there if you're into reading this winter I think it's called What Trout See and it's about you know guys fish out in New Zealand and they fish the simplest darn flies and I've tried those flies, they catch fish. Uh, the problem is I'm always torn between tying an aesthetically pleasing fly to myself and something that's utilitarian. So find that middle ground and get after it and have some fun. Find what makes you happy tying flies. We're tying this one on the newer AREX, uh, let me get that out of the light, the FW570, again a size 12. This is a heavier wire dry fly hook, and I recommend this to those of you who know where some of those bigger fish are hiding. For years, the, the TMC 100 was the industry standard, and I think it still is. It's a great hook. I buy those by the 100 pack, but sometimes you need a little bit heavier wire. This has a little bit wider hook gap, as you can see as well. So it's really good if you're keeling a dry fly, which sounds a little silly, but this fly, I want a little bit extra weight underneath here to hopefully sink the butt section just a teeny bit. That's my, my mindset. This is maybe overthinking this again, but the other great part about this is the eye tends to be a little bit, a little bit larger, so it's a little bit easier to thread for those of you who do have some issues with that. I'm going to change up threads. I'm using a Vivas dot here. Again, lightest thread that you can get away with. So know yourself as a tire. If you're heavy-handed, 6 dot is going to be a definitely, definitely going to be a better choice for this fly. We're just going to start this, you know, an eye length behind and build a bit of a thread base here. I'm going to work back to the point of the hook. Everybody see that okay? All right, good. I haven't shifted this too much. Sometimes I gotta check my focus. All right. First thing we're gonna tie in, same thing as last fly. We're actually gonna go back right to that Antron yarn again. You can use Zelon, whatever you got. We get tons of questions about Zelon, and the reason we usually don't carry it, honestly, is it's about three to four times as much as Antron. Super expensive. This still catches fish. Um, the other one out there though that we really liked, Evan uses this a lot. It's called Sparkle Emerger Yarn. Uh, I believe it's a hairline product and it's great. It's a little bit sparklier maybe than Antron. Again, less is more with these. It's, I mean, it's so, I, I know that orange is in the way with my sweatshirt, but uh, Dave is asking what vice I'm tying on here. This is the Renzetti Traveler 2000 base model. This does have the Game Changer Jaws on here, which was designed with um, 
uh, Blaine Chocolate, of course. But I like them. I get a little bit more access to the back end of the hook with this with this jaw as well. It holds small hooks just as well as those the shanks and the and the big hooks. So been happy. Pinch wrap here. Pinch wrap is one of the most essential things you can teach yourself. And what I'm doing is pinching the hook between these two fingers and then carrying the thread in pinching it with my fingers and pulling down and it's something that's really worth teaching yourself if you don't have it in your arsenal yet I did not mention this yet I've kind of been holding back but uh, I'm working on a beginner fly tying series of videos it's going to mirror what our in-person classes would be it's going to be really really in-depth uh, but if you're a beginning tire, start looking for that next year. It'll be on the same platform, YouTube. So it's going to be it's going to be fun. I'm excited. We're gonna we got all this cool production gear. We may as well use it and try and get some people out there tying that might not be near a shop and might be in the middle of nowhere, but really want to try and tie some flies and catch some fish on them. Next thing we're going to use a little bit different some of you may have this some of you may not this is Coq de Lyon you may have heard of it it's a fancy French word <laughs> uh, but it's this really pretty speckled feather it has this really cool iridescence this ginger color um, really this or mallard works just as well uh, barred mallard here you could also use some spade hackle but this is kind of a combo tail we're using a little bit of two materials I'm just gonna pull one of these off and I'm gonna pull some of these really really fine feathers usually we see these a lot more on the Euro nymphs nowadays especially the the quick sinking flies like the paradigons I'm gonna pull a section of that off Pinch it and measure not quite I keep these a little bit shorter I like the yarn to be just a teeny bit longer you know I see a fair amount of these that where they're exactly the same um, same length and I usually keep this just a little bit shorter than the full shank length I don't know that's just me Transfer that measurement again to your left hand, again, the pin trap, to your new best friend. Okay, this is not, we're not going to leave this yarn full length here, um, but we're going to wrap up. We're just going to bind this material as much as we can. The reason I don't cut this material, and sometimes I don't see this explained, um, if I chop this here, you'd have a hump and you'd have to spend the time filling that with thread so I prefer usually just to tie it up to where I know my next piece of material is going to go in so three quarters of the way up and then I can trim it off and then I'm gonna, I have a consistent kind of width and diameter of this material this Vivas thread tends to be a little bit more corded up, so you may want to spin it every once in a while, flatten it out just a little bit. And again, bring it to the point. Next material, turkey biots. I do not see enough of you tying flies with these. Yes, dubbing works. It does. It works great. It catches fish. But... I love tying with turkey biots. They're a little intimidating. I get that. Um, but what they give you for a little bit of effort is a really naturally segmented body. And it can be it can be just such a, a cool look. Mr. Spaulding, thanks for tuning in on the West Coast. Good to talk to you the other day. All right big note with these is you're gonna have two sides uh, it's gonna be easier to see in the small screen down in your corner here you're gonna have this big section here 
and then this looks like nothing here but this is actually the side you want to use these are really nice stiff little pieces of feather and sometimes if you're lucky you'll get the packs where these are all the sides already cut off and you don't have to play the guessing game but this is the side you want to pull from now there's two sides to this I know I know we're zoomed really far in here but I'm going to try and show this I almost have to bump the light up there's a clear translucent side and then there's a more solid side this is important because those two sides will give you two different looks on your fly if you want to tie a really you know cool kind of nymph I know Landon Mayer used to tie a caddis nymph with with kind of a green biot and what happens is when you tie with that translucence forward it wraps over that ridge and it takes away some of that some of that segmentation and it looks good but usually with the dry fly we like that leading edge that solid edge to be forward and we're going to tie in with the tip I'm going to try so you can see what's actually happening here remember that technique from the first fly where I actually lift both these up see there's a gap here so I know I need one more wrap of thread so I don't want to try and wrap a material backwards to fill in a space I've left. I could have just filled in with thread. Again, I'm going to spin my thread, my bobbin here. I flatten this out. Usually with biot bodies, I'm, I'm not really worried about building a taper, but I'd like this thread body to be fairly uniform. So I, I am going to pay attention to that because I tied in three different materials at the back and it's a, it's got a bit of a bump. All right. Half hitch time. Save your work. Grab your cradle. And I'm going to grab some hackle pliers for this one. You could try to do it by hand, but you don't have a ton of material to work with here. So I would I would prefer usually to use hackle pliers. This style is the best. Don't try and tell me otherwise, because I have owned probably five different pairs. And they're all substandard to this silly little plunger. I know it's it's the cheapest thing you can get, but it is it's it's perfect so I'm gonna try and clip this back edge all right and then we're gonna start wrapping and try not to twist this sometimes and those thin edges get twisted and you know what I may have misspoke earlier I actually have the translucent side forward here and you don't get a ton. You, I mean, look at this. This is a size 12. It's only going to wrap up so far here. Grab this. I know. Sorry. I got stuff in the way. Uh, I broke it. It happens. Just laugh about it, guys. That's okay. Holy cow. All right. Slight meltdown. Don't panic. Don't panic. It's okay. It's okay. It happens to everyone. We can fix this very easily. Because we didn't break this off at the point. So we're just going to rewrap it. This happens. No problem. That's all we're going to get out of that. That's okay because that that loop wing really does come back pretty far and we're going to cover some of that up with dubbing anyways. You know, I, I've had a lot of people over the years that are so worried about every element of their fly being exact. And I think that one of the true arts of fly tying is learning to use the next material to cover up any imperfections in the previous material. And that's... 
that's always worked for me where, you know, maybe I didn't get the cleanest tie off spot. That's okay. No worries. Um, again, I, I did forget to mention, of course, I get ahead of myself. We're tying in Hendrickson pink. This is one of the, uh, one of the very first hatches of the year is the Hendrickson, and it tends to be a little bit larger insect. So you can go, and a 12 is usually not too big. Excuse me, 12s and 14s are awesome. So know that this is a good fly to start with because you're not overdoing it on the size. And next we're gonna use some Nature Spirit CDC. Uh, we also carry some Wopsy, it's good stuff. Everybody. You know, most of the CDC out there is really good unless you get the Ultra Select. That's really cool. The reason I'm dumping this bag out is not to make a giant mess. Brian said he's going to sweep them off in the morning, so it's a sweet deal for me. Um, I'm, I'm trying to I'm make myself laugh. I'm trying to find two feathers that are approximately similar length because I want those tips to match up. And I'll show you. I know it's probably a little hard to see. Thought about adding a third camera and a top camera. I think that's going to come in time. We're in no rush to add more complications to this. All right. I'm going to show you. See how you can almost, you can't even tell that's two feathers because I've lined those tips up there. If you're tying smaller flies, we're talking 16s and smallers, you you may actually be able to get away with one feather, but two tends to look a lot better. And we need to tie this in before we dub the thorax up front. And just like, remember we talked about concave convex with feathers earlier, I want these to kind of cup up. And I'm actually going to use a bit of a pinch wrap and just one wrap. This is really important because We'll call that a gathering wrap. I'm going to grab these stems and I'm actually going to bring this back to where the tips are just inside of the eye there. You can see that? Rotate. Great. And now I'm going to wrap back on them and really make sure that, oops, almost lost them there, that they're on top of the shank. Another advantage of using ADOT here is I can really crank down on there and I'm not worried about building up too much thread because we're going to fold those over. Make sure they're on top of the shank. Looking pretty good. Sometimes I'll tug on them a little bit, make sure they're durable. All right, we're going to add a little bit of super fine. Checking, holy cow, I got all sorts of comments. Yeah. Hey, Aaron, good to see you. Well, not see you, but you see me, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Doo, doo, doo. David, what's happening? <laughs> no, I'm not growing my nails out. No way. <laughs> Ugh. I have this thing where it, I feel like it's this, uh, I don't know, all of a sudden, when they're so long you gotta trim them right away and I just I usually carry trimmers in the car with me and I'll, it's okay we don't need to talk about that that's can't wait for people to replay that and hear about it all right I'm leaving almost an eye length up front because I want to add a little bit of partridge up front One of my tricks always with dubbing is to wet the thread. I know dubbing is one of the tougher things for people to get when they're first learning. Almost always they're just using way too much. Honestly, too much. A little bit of time. My goal here is just to put just enough on so you can't see I'm using black thread. Right? Trying to build a little bit of a ball here. Check. Looking good. Eh, 
There's one part I want to cover. This is another nice reason to have rotary vices. I had a little bit of thread showing there. Just one more little application. All right, there we go. Next thing we need to do is fold these CDC feathers over big trick here is folding them over and then working back. A lot of times I'll put one wrap or two wraps on and then check it. I'll step back, make sure it looks like there's a loop there. The great things about these feathers is if you, I mean, you almost have to look at them in really good light, but there's all these tiny little pieces coming off, little almost fibers coming off each one of these strands and they hold air bubbles. And it looks so realistic when you fish these floating down the river. And it's it's one of those materials that's it's natural, and I think it's not going away anytime soon. Now I'm going to use my left hand here. See, I'm forming that bubble, and then I'm going to come in and pinch with my left hand. Put one, two wrap on there. I want to see what it looks like. That's a little bit much, probably. I'll probably downsize that just a little bit. And that's the, the advantage of using one or two wraps there, is you can adjust on the fly. So I want this actually to be fairly wide, you can see there, to cover the top of that, veil it, if you will. I'm going to try and line those stems back up. That's what I'm looking for right there. All right. Lift in front of that stem and put some wraps down. Make sure you really lock this in because it will try and elude you and just come undone on its own. Great. All right, looking good so far. Last thing we're going to add, if I could find it, a little piece of partridge. This is one of my favorite things I've bought over the years is a partridge skin. It's a small investment. Usually you're not spending over $40, but gosh, you get so many beautiful feathers that just seem to last forever and ever. Um, soft hackle is one of those underfished things, but great nymph legs, things like that. I'm going to peel all the marabou shenanigans stuff off the bottom. Expose the tip. Now usually I'd prefer to tie in maybe sometimes at the stem, but so we're just going to try and get one wrap. Maybe two. We'll see how it looks with this. So we're just going to do the tip here. I'm going to half hitch here because I know I've harped on using a, a rotary vise for these delicate presentations. This is exactly what I'm talking about. I break so, so, I mean, just so many feathers when I'm just using a regular vise. This has really improved my happiness at the vise is breaking less feathers. So first of all, I'm kind of going to preen them back, and orient them. I can really use just the lightest amount of control there. And it looks like we got room for two wraps. I would not do any more. I don't want this to be crazy, crazy up front. So I'm going to do two wraps there, two in the front, and then one more. Come in and tie that off. 
and we are looking good all right now we're gonna clean up this little nub on the top you can see with the whip finish I see a lot of people try and clean this up before you get to the whip finish but why not incorporate it right into you tying the fly off and then that's just works in your favor it's less less material you're adding all right come in trim that off the last thing to do is trim these tail fibers the yarn we first tied in that's the fly right there I know that orange is probably not helping you see things sorry about that I just wanted to show off there we go this is a great fly because it can be fished in a whole different I mean a whole bunch of ways you can fish this in the film you can fish it you know slightly into the surface as a soft hackle it works great for a bunch of different things so play with this turkey bites are cheap you can get them in tons of different colors and they last a long time this one's several years old so you saw that we had a little bit of an issue there but easy to fix don't get overwhelmed just keep tying laugh about it learn from it um, let's hop on over to the chat see if we can answer some questions keep hydrated here how many of you actually were actually tying with us I know Brian is he came in and bought some hooks thanks again Brian um, on that note thank you all of our loyal customers who've been in this holiday season we've been overwhelmed with how much people are are tying and fishing and getting out there having fun with it this year um, it's so cool to see people progress and bring us pictures of their flies and you know we love helping with that stuff so don't never be afraid to ask for advice even if you're you know halfway across the country that's what we're here for you know we may be a small town independent fly shop but we're here to help people learn and get out on the water that's why we we don't say it just just to say it we actually like doing it so um, let's see thanks for tuning in Brian I uh, hope you're doing well I haven't seen you in a little while uh, any questions on these flies how to fish them anything like that um, I never heard if anybody's using UV finish on their dry flies if it's just me again that was flow uh, wrong camera this stuff is awesome used a lot of different lights the past few years but this infinity lights probably my favorite it's rechargeable really nice um, I know Eric uses this to charge up uh, I think his ice fishing jigs which is a smart way to go because you don't have to buy batteries and it's chunky has a lanyard so multiple uses there um, let's see Joe's asking, uh, with biot style dry flies, do you ever put a little super glue underneath? Absolutely. Um, probably should have done that on this one, let's be honest. It, it probably wouldn't have come unraveled like that, but a little dab of Zappa Gap would be awesome. The downside is with these really small hooks, you can overdo it. Usually what I would do is put a dab on a sticky note and use a bodkin to really control the precise amount of super glue you'd put on your thread before you're wrapping your biots. I think that that can be really helpful and make for a really durable fly. Good question. Time of year to fish these. Uh, this is the when you're itching badly to get out in the spring and go chase some flies. Um, time of year to fish these since it's it's more of a Hendrickson color scheme. Um, this is usually in my box of dry flies that is it's kind of the hail mary box i'll usually be fishing streamers in the spring and then once in a while we'll see a little hendrickson emergence and i'll throw these right on and get rocking but usually that's not until you know end of april 
The problem with the Hendrickson hatch sometimes is that it happens before the trout opener and most people are out there. But remember, in Michigan, we're lucky enough to have a fair amount of our rivers open year round and you can go out and you can chase these hatches. It's a lot of fun. They're good size flies. You will have no doubt what these flies are when they start coming off because they are sizable. Plus you haven't seen a dry fly hatch all winter long. Maybe if you're lucky, a blue winged olive or an early stone, but this is the real true beginning of dry fly season in Northern Michigan. Let's see, what else do we got? Um, let's see, let me check one thing before we sign off. Just wanna check the schedule, make sure I get everything right for what's coming up. So, we'll probably uh, start to call it a night. I'm gonna eat the spaghetti that I forgot to earlier. Uh, but I just ran out of time and I'm going to go see my dogs and hopefully all of you have an awesome, awesome new year. Stay healthy. Please um, get out there and fish. Send us all your questions. If you haven't done so, please think about subscribing. That really helps us out. Uh, hit that notification button. Maybe the thumbs up. Leave us a comment. If you have questions, you think about comments or questions later. Um, we love to to see you guys out there on the water sending us your pictures we love sharing those uh shoot us a message at instagram we're at at the northern angler um and check us out at the northern angler.com if you want to support us this material list is available on our website and i'll make sure it ends up in the description there so you can tie flies just like this hopefully even prettier so thanks everyone uh let's see uh, cranking wants me to go fishing with him. Uh, that sounds good. Uh, <laughs> in New York, man, I've never fished New York. That I've seen some monster fish come out of there. But um, Jay, thanks so much. Uh, it's always been fun seeing you in here weekly, buying materials. Brian, you as well. Everyone, uh, let's let's make 2021 an awesome year on the water and at the vice. So thanks for tuning, everyone. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you next week with Johnny Ray tying smallmouth bass flies. You're not going to want to miss it.